So what's been making the, the rounds lately is uh, the idea that you want to have VO2 max as high as possible. And there's almost this skew of, you know, we need to be elite endurance athletes to maximize our longevity. And that's in part because of, uh, not to name drop, but Peter Atia. And Peter is basically referencing this paper. And this paper will be in the video's description. Um, so if you're interested, uh, check it out. And what they did here was they compared uh, six groups of uh, fitness levels from least fit to extremely fit. They quantified it by METS, which can be translated into VO2 max. So the extremely fit group had a VO2 max of around 51, whereas the least fit was uh, 17. So that's our range, 17 least fit to 51 extremely fit. And then when looking at mortality risk, which is shown here, all cause mortality risk, when using the extremely fit group, again, VO2 max of 51, and comparing that against all the other groups, people that had that VO2 max in the least fit of 17 uh, had a fourfold higher uh, risk of death for all causes. So the least fit, fourfold higher risk of death for all causes. So that that's the uh, the idea that's been circulating that you know we need to have a VO2 max as high as possible, but I haven't seen Peter mention any numbers. So it's important to put that into context because because as you mentioned, your pre-marathon training was 53 or 55? 55. 55. And this is without, I mean, what kind of training volume running wise per week? Well, I'm, I'm only doing uh, a half an hour, uh, actually two half hour runs per week, but I've been doing it consistently for um, three or five years. Um, so I think I'm pretty maxed out actually, as far as my VO2 max goes, although I did gain even more once I bumped it up to marathon level training. Yeah. But the point there is we don't need four hours or six hours. I mean, you're doing it from an hour and you've got a VO2 yeah. max of 50. So I think that's an important point because like I said, the, 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 the data, the meme that's perpetuating on social media is that we've got to be elite endurance athletes. And from your data, one hour in conjunction with all the other, all of the other weight training and everything else you're doing, um, mm -hmm. VO2 max over 50, you're in the extremely fit group. So the, the other thing too here is to, to point out the extremely fit group, VO2 max of 51, when compared with the high fit group, which had a VO2 max of 42. And I should say, from my own experience, I've measured VO2 max, same thing, face mask, the whole thing, a real VO2 max test, not this uh, you know estimated stuff based on resting heart rate, which is not reliable or not nowhere near as close to reliable. I mean, there are, you know, people online who are like my, my Apple watch says my resting heart rate is this, my predicted VO2 max is, is 60. And, and, and I'm like, dude, you're 60 <laughs> years old. There's no way. There's just no way. So, um, so when comparing, so I, from my own experience, three VO2 max in the lab uh, from 2012 to 2017 or 2018, I was in the low forties each time. Now that's with my regular, workouts, my full body 90 minute workout plus walking. It was 15 to 20 miles per week, no running at all. So you don't have to be an elite endurance athlete to be in the quote unquote high category for VO2 max. Now is my VO2 max the same since then? I have measured, I can't say, um, but at worst I'd imagine I'm in the fit group, but I, 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 I who knows? I'd have to measure it. The, 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 the interesting factor here is that VO2 max is milliliters of oxygen consumed per kg body weight. So I'm 20 pounds lighter or, or 15 pounds lighter than I was then reducing the denominator. So assuming my maximum ability to consume oxygen hasn't changed, or even if it has changed with the lower cardio training volume, I'm not walking 15 to 20 miles a week on, anymore on purpose. Um, I find it hard to believe that it would be dramatically different, but all right, nonetheless, comparing the 51 VO2 max versus the 40, 42, you can see that even having high fitness, 39% increased risk of death relative to the highest fit group. Okay, so that's big news. I mean, that's basically saying you want to have your VO2 max above 50 relative to the 40s, right? And to put that into further perspective, you know, people who had uh, CKD, chronic kidney disease, 49% increased risk of death. So, you know, being high fit is almost as bad as having CKD relative to someone who's uh, extremely fit with a VO2 max of 51. So, so this is very pretty, pretty astounding data, right? But there is some devil in the details. And uh, this brings us to the mortality risk across fitness categories according to age groups. So 
this study included a very wide age range um, from 30 year olds all the way up to 90 year olds. And you can see the sample sizes for each. They're very large sample sizes, which is great news. And then comparing at each, each age group, getting all the way up to 80 to 95 years from least fit to extremely fit. And now the referent is defined as the people who are the least fit, VO2 max of about 17. So again, once again, within every group, if your VO2 max was, what was it, 51, around 51 in the extremely fit group, you had an 84% chance lower risk of all-cause mortality for 30 to 49-year-olds, 78%, 80%, 66%, 73% reduced relative to the least fit group. But where the details start to become uh, you know, uh, interesting, at least for me, is when you look at the highly fit group and see the extremely fit group, okay, now it's only a 10% difference in terms of lower risk. Now, granted, 10% is still a big deal. I don't want to throw away any uh, association for reducing mortality risk, but this idea that the 40s versus the 50s in VO2 max is this dramatic reduction, maybe as bad as CKD or other smoking, it's, it's kind of overblown. I mean, here, for, uh, 50 to 59-year-olds, there's only a 6% difference for the VO2 max of 42 versus uh, the 51, 8% for the 60 to 69 year olds, 13% and okay, 15%. But where this, the story gets a bit more interesting is, you know, when considering that the 50 group um, has a the lowest all cause mortality risk at every age range, and is even better than the, than the high fit group in terms of all, all cause mortality risk, then the expectation is, well, you must live to 115 years. You must get, or 120, you must get to the maximum lifespan. Your VO2 max is 50. You're going to get to the max lifespan. What's your life expectancy if you have a VO2 max of greater than 50? So they looked at that. And here it was men with peak exercise capacity of 10 to 12 Mets. That's a VO2 max of 35 to 43. So this is not actually looking at the, uh, the greater than 50. So the fit and the highly fit. They only live five, four and a half years longer compared to the lowest fit, the people who had a VO2 max of 17. I mean, that's a five-year increase in average life expectancy. And those with the extremely fit, higher than uh, 51 VO2 max, had a six-year. This isn't a 25-year. This is going from 73 to you know 79 years, right? So one thing I'm always talking about is how can we do better than the eat real food and exercise approach? A VO2 max of 50 is great, but if you're telling me I'm only going to expect to live to 80, that's just not good enough. Can we titrate the exercise dose? Can we look at biomarkers of overtraining? Can we look at blood biomarkers to make sure our liver, as you saw, isn't chronically you know, damaged or muscle damage? All right, so what about for the women? So the story is about the same. In this case, the, um, the uh, 10 to 11 and a half Mets, so that's a VO2 max of 35 to 40. They lived only two and a half years longer than the lowest fit group, which is outrageous. I mean, their VO2 max is double. And, you know, if we only go by, you want to have a VO2 max as high as possible. I mean, that's only a two and a half year longer life expectancy. And I'm not trying to diminish that. It's important. I just want to add context to what's already out there. And then for the yeah. highest, for the highest fit group, just to finish it off real quick, um, mm -hmm. for the highest fit group, it was about seven years. But again, this is going from a life expectancy of 69 years and lowest fit to 76. Again, not 95, not 115. Um, so, Right. So I, I, I agree with your point. And I think that as you brought up, the one of the more important things to look at is that this is divided by your body mass, your, your weight. So this isn't one indicator of how your lung capacity is or your mitochondria is, because as soon as you divide it by the weight, that can overwhelm things. If you're on the heavy side, then even if your lung uh, performance is above average, if your weight is greater than that, you're not going to be in the elite and the other elite, despite the fact that you could be quite, uh, have quite a good cardiorespiratory system. So um, in some ways, I feel like this is... Uh, they talk about it being as fit as possible, but in some ways I feel that what they're really saying is that it's important to keep a low BMI overall. So um, that's an interesting point because I should have brought up uh, the the uh, demographics, the subject demographics in the paper. And it, it was the average, the average BMI within groups, within each age group was overweight or obese. What that means is 
a BMI of 25 to 30 is considered overweight. And actually, if I remember correctly, the BMI for each group was closer to 28, 29, 30 in each age group. So these were overweight people. And then in some cases, it was uh, an average BMI of 30 or more, which is clinically defined as obese. So, but what that says is for this paper is if you are overweight or obese and can attain a VO2 max of greater than 50, you will still have the lowest risk of all cause mortality. But their models were adjusted for age, sex, BMI. Um, but I, what you're raising is the more interesting point of what if your BMI was lean and you had the BMI, the, the, the VO2 max greater than 50, what's the life expectancy gain there? And I didn't see that as a subset. I wish they did. But now that population is unfortunately probably very small. We're talking a very very small group in terms of maybe hundreds, not 20 or 30,000 if they had in each of these age groups. So just to finish off too, with the uh, people who are older than 70 with a uh, cardiorespiratory fitness greater than seven Mets, which is a VO2 max of 25, uh, they only lived about three years longer compared to the lowest fit group. So again, you know, this hmm. idea of, of uh, you know, granted that I goal is to be as fit as possible, not just you know, strength and mobility balance, but also VO2 max. This is only a two, a, a three year gain in life expectancy. The, you know, they lived to 87 years on average versus 85 years. So, um, so I, I think it's important to frame the context of, you know, what, what Peter's putting out there, uh, you know, that VO2 max is an important component, but I think we, we need more specific markers. Uh, it isn't just, you know, eat real food and exercise, get good sleep. It's how can we, you know, get the exercise prescription and get the dietary prescription and, um, you know, look at biomarkers of organ and systemic function to really push us beyond these 87 and 95 year, um, you know, caps for life expectancy and studies. I mean, I'd, I'd add to that, uh, play the long game on this. When you're going for longevity, um, it's easy to, if you're trying to maximize VO2 or your VO2 max, right now this month unless you have a race coming up or like a marathon <laughs> it it you can take your time on it and over time even if you're starting at a standard level if you're continuing to practice it on a weekly basis eventually you will find yourself in the extremely fit group as sort of uh time takes its toll and you're able to reduce the normal loss as you just age from in a sedentary fashion so what do you think about it? i agree 100 percent um I have a couple of factors too. What do you think about the exercise dose that maximizes not just VO2 max, but general fitness while also attempting to optimize heart rate variability and resting heart rate? In other words, high HRV, low resting heart rate, you know, looking for that dose that maximizes all three, where I think most people are only focused on how high can I get my VO2 max? And if my heart rate variability and resting heart rate looks overtrained and aged, relative to my chronological age, who cares, right? So what do you think about that combination as an exercise prescription? So I, I keep it uh, minimal. I'm always trying to get the most benefit for the, the least amount of effort. So um, my aerobic exercise, um, despite being quite fit, I'm very consistent. So I virtually never miss even a week of exercising. But just the, the um, two half an hour sessions of doing running, um, I find enough to keep the VO2 max as long as it's on a really consistent basis. Um, if you take like a month off, then all of a sudden then the low, the, low, um, the low dose doesn't work because it will take you too long to catch back up to where you were. And then if you lose another month, then now you're basically you're almost untrained. Um, a study that I looked at that did VO2 max training had basically a, a 12 week washout period um, to basically return the person, their cardiorespiratory fitness back, back to baseline as if they had never done any exercise at all. So um, it, even before three months uh, or 12 weeks of resting, even if you're taking like two or three weeks, I think that if you're combining it with a, a low regular dosage is going to be a problem. But if you're able to be consistent in it, then you can use that to optimize both your HRV and uh, high and your heart resting heart rate low by only doing a little bit of exercise each week. I actually find that on my exercise days, because it's half an hour, I know that your routines are usually more on an hour or so, if I remember correctly. 90, 90 minutes. Not, there you go, an hour and a half. So. 
I don't even notice an impact on my HRV or resting heart rate the day after I do those exercises. In fact, those are some of my better days because they're combined with my fasting and other things. So um, I think the key to, to, to working all those dials is to find a very efficient uh, thing and then do the get the most benefit out of doing the least effort on it and then be consistent about it. Yeah, 